evening, everyone. Welcome to MSQ's webinar. My name is Echo Hindo Yang, CEO of MSQ Ventures. Um, hope everyone and your family are doing very well at this tough time. As you know, MSQ's webinar has been focused on how global biotech companies can work together to fight against COVID-19 since January this year. And today, I'm very honored to have uh, Kehal, a chairman of uh, Open Often, to join us today. Welcome, Kehal. How are you today? Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. I'm rather well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so uh, we actually, um, Open Often, have been like uh, very active since the last year, and uh, especially uh, when the uh, COVID-19 outbreak in China, you. Uh, even made the more the big movement on this area on March 6th uh, this year open often like uh, signed the first contract uh, um, that uh, in the house CIO service of uh, HVO and uh, van so for in the merge so congratulations on this so how much is the project to revenue from this pro contract because we know um, as a biotech company actually um, you are just very young, but you already made the revenue and you are very successful already. So can you share some of the insights with us? Yeah, the echo what we've done, look, Open North when we only IPO June last year, yeah. uh, we said it was going to be an acquisition vehicle. It was going to be services, it's going to be pharma. We acquired Van Life Science June last year. It was a small European based uh, preclinical early stage pharma services. And in January, we acquired the jewel in the crown, which is HVivo. HVivo have been based in London for 30 years. They're the world leader in testing of vaccines and antivirals through a technique known as human challenge study models. What are human challenge study models? That means you can test a vaccine. It's basically a 2B trial, comes before, comes after phase one, comes before phase three. And basically we take on average 100 volunteers uh, 50 of them will get the placebo, 50 of them will get the real deal vaccine, and then we will test and we will infect them with whatever virus we want to test. And in our quarantine clinic, over a 10 day period, we can find out uh, does that vaccine work or does it not? It's done in a very controlled environment. We're one of the few companies in the world who do this. We're the only person with 24 bed quarantine uh, clinic, which each bedroom is totally quarantined. And uh, yeah, we, we've a long history of doing it for RSV, flu, COPD, uh, asthma, any respiratory diseases. And the exciting part is now we announced in early March that we were going to launch the world's first coronavirus challenge study model. So that's where, where we are today. Yeah, and uh, so in the March, you also have been featured in the Wall Street Journal and a few more media ch uh, channels have been regarding the words, the first human challenge started, you just mentioned for coronavirus. So the, could you please share, that's exciting, what's going on there and the latest status of this planned study and uh, what's the results there? Because I think now everyone, uh, we kind of like only thing we can do i just feel we can stay like stay home and wait for something come up so what are you are doing now is really speed up the process yeah echo look what we're doing uh, is doing human challenge study models to test vaccines as you know the world is slowly coming back to normal uh, as we said earlier but it won't come fully back to normal first of all you have to have antivirals so we test them, but most antiviral studies at the moment are being done in hospitals, live on patients. So we believe four, five, six weeks, you'll have a lot of antivirals working. There's over a hundred in testing. Uh, but the big piece of work for us is that we all know the world won't come back to normality till there's a vaccine. Our belief is there'll be a number of vaccines. North America will have some, uh, Asia, China will have some, and the European bloc will have some. So there's a, it will not, like the antiviral, will not be a winner takes all. There'll be numerous, effective vaccines there won't be a single one and where we come in normally to talk about vaccine being a long journey at the moment in london there's some early stage vaccines doing phase one work we all know biotech phase one is first in human as for toxicity you test two three hundred people you monitor them carefully make sure the vaccine is not toxic mm -hmm. the next stage is phase two and again that takes time and ultimately a large phase three field trial that can be 10 or 15,000 patients. 
within the pandemic, the time taken to a 10 or 15,000 patient is a year or two or three. We don't have that time. So that work comes into human channel study models. Basically, we can cut out phase three, but now we have to have regulator, FDA, Chinese regulator and government approvals. But our proposal, and it's Harvard only published a week ago saying this is the way to go. So you do phase one for toxicity, and then you do a human channel study model. That's where we provide 100 volunteers uh, and we will test the vaccine by inoculate them all with a vaccine, half with a placebo, half with the real deal of the vaccine. Then those volunteers in groups of 24, we bring them in for 10 days into our hospital. We're part of Queen Mary's Hospital in East London, monitor them very carefully. And then on day two or day three, uh, our plan at this point had been with infect them with a coronavirus vaccine, which we have access and control to monitor them. And we can see very quickly who gets sick and who doesn't. Does the vaccine work or not? We are expecting in the coming weeks or months to announce rather than use a coronavirus, uh, which is OC43, most of the big, there's about 10 very large vaccine companies all around the world at an early stage in phase one. It will take them a long time to complete phase three. And they're saying to us, rather than use coronavirus, why not go real deal version, wild version of OC uh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there's a possibility in the weeks ahead, you will see more news about us potentially launching the world's first uh, coronavirus or uh, COVID-19 challenge study model, which is risky. Uh, but we believe if it's done in the confines of our uh, high security, high safety uh, facility in London, it can be done safely. Okay, that's great. And uh, so that sounds uh, the very innovative the technology, and but it also is very kind of like a save the time. So how long do you like uh, in the how far you see the first vaccine can be? Uh, we will get the first vaccine to be like a uh, used for uh, for us. Okay, well, basically, we've known uh, COVID-19 has only been around, call it, three, four, five months. Uh, the vaccine race really started actively since your Chinese government gave the genetic basis to it in late January. So we've only really had two, three months work. It has a number of vaccines have gone first in human. That is phase one in the past couple of weeks, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, the two of the UK universities did first in human. However, uh, they're all saying possibly later this year, possibly early next year. The big issue is how can a vaccine company test 10 or 20,000 people, uh, particularly in a field where the disease is under control. If you're testing people and there's no disease around, you don't know if the virus vaccine works. So what we do, we cut three years to three months. So a human challenge study model is over three months, we can prove A, if it's safe, and B, does it work by basically testing the vaccine in our quarantine clinic in London on uh, volunteers. Yeah. So, so it's three years to three months. That's the time frame that a human challenge study model would have a vaccine ready. Okay. Do you think that is any of the cooperation, global cooperation you are uh, working on can speed up, even can speed up for this process? Yeah, look, I think it all revolves, all companies can speed things up. There's two Chinese companies, as you're probably well aware, that are well down the track of having a COVID-19 vaccine. There's a number of North American, there's a number of European. But ultimately, somebody somewhere has to decide, how do you test, does that vaccine work in a phase three trial? That's 10 to 15,000 patients. Mm -hmm. How long will you find out, does it work or does it not? So we're suggesting uh, that... The only way to do it quickly, the only way you can have a vaccine ready for late this year, early next year, is to use a human challenge study model. It's called a 2B instead of a phase three. And that can be started and finished in less than six months. So that meant if we had a, a working vaccine today, we could have proved to be effective uh, by, by autumn time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Sean, uh, you're in China, yeah. I know that like, uh, China was the first one out of break happen in China. And then uh, actually the Chinese company have been uh, actively developed the vaccine and the treatment. So what do you see the opportunity like uh, China and uh, Open Often can work together? Can you give some of the comments? Yes, actually, uh, the, the, the first uh, patient there is in China and a lot of uh, the uh, 
uh, drugs and uh, uh, including vaccines and also the other drugs uh, uh, and the clinical trials in China. And I think uh, the China's uh, pharmaceutical companies, they will have interest to, to cooperate with like you, the CR companies, because you can help them to accelerate the speed, uh, to accelerate the, the progresses. I think uh, if the Chinese um, pharmaceutical companies, if they want to uh, uh, finally get, uh, finally uh, to have their uh, product to be launched on the world, they definitely need an a, uh, international a CR company. So uh, in, in that area, you will have uh, use your poster experience on vaccine development, so you can uh, do some help. And also, I think uh, actually um, many of the Chinese pharmaceuticals, they want to um, they want to do a, a multi-center uh, trials uh, around the world. And, uh, and also, uh, even with some uh, diagnostic or even some uh, treatment way, they will have interest to cooperate. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for your insight and, about and, China. And, so, and okay. actually, and actually, I have a question: is uh, because the uh, COVID nineteen is a, a new, uh, new, a new uh, virus. But uh, uh, I, I have a question: is uh, do you have any experience on the uh, your the uh, past successful experience on other vaccine development? Like uh, with your technology, is there uh, faster to compare with the uh, traditional way? Absolutely, Sean, good question. Yeah, the, it's well known. The human challenge study models can eliminate a phase three. A phase three is generally two to three years. Human challenge study model, that's subject to regular approval. Um, in the past, we've done numerous, for 25 years, HV4 subsidiaries done numerous human challenge study models. We've never had one person get seriously ill. We've put thousands through the system. So it definitely, this is the time when you can shorten years to months by using the human challenge study model. Okay. And we've actually just from the Chinese audience, we've already offered in this past week to the Chinese regulator uh, that, that we believe they're actively trying at the moment, particularly if the disease is under control and has been suppressed in China, finding patients to try test the vaccine will be difficult. So we've said, HVO from our London office could remotely run a human challenge study model tomorrow in China. So our view is we want to make our services available to companies all over the world. We've done this for 30 years. We're very happy to work in conjunction with any Chinese company and the Chinese regulator to take your vaccine and run a human challenge study model, which means within three, four or five months, you will know, does it work or does it not? Mm. Okay. I think it's only the global cooperation work together uh, happen. That's only uh, can benefit to everyone in the world. So, um, Kel, I'm very interested in your background because uh, uh, yourself actually have been so successful building the the companies in the different uh, sector, the industry, like you build uh, the broker dealer firm and uh, sold for the $80 million. And then you build another, the oil and the gas company. I think that is another interesting topic uh, in this week. But uh, we're going to focus on uh, open offer and then you found it, established the open offer. So can you just uh, share with us what's uh, the, um, What's the motivation for you and the build the open offer and which is totally different from what you did before? Yeah, uh, Echo, good question. Look, basically I'm a finance person. As you know, finance gives you one skill. Uh, it means you're almost a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Uh, and most finance people admit that, that you've got to learn how to put things together. So we hire very good people. I just enjoy putting companies together, uh, hiring really good people. We got lucky with a company four years ago called Amrit Pharmaceutical PLC. We started it as a sp former small oil and gas company. We converted into Amrit and last year Amrit did $150 million in, in orphan drug sales and has an enterprise value of close to 500 million. So that was a, a lucky break. Uh, it focused on orphan drugs. So we set up Open Orphan to focus on services, particularly from orphan drugs. But now in the last six months, we've kind of pivoted to infectious diseases because we acquired, uh, and again, finance people, we acquired, I didn't know what a challenge study model six months ago, and, and now I'm telling the world what they are. But I think an entrepreneur, we've got to take risks as well. We're asking people, volunteers, to come into a clinic 
and potentially be infected with COVID-19. So I've made it clear to all our staff, as the entrepreneur, the head of the company, I'm going to be the first person who's going to offer to be a volunteer to try the COVID-19. It's going to be done in our clinic, It'll be done under very careful circumstances. I think if I'm not prepared to do it, I wouldn't expect anybody else to try it. Mm, wow, that is quite a journey. And also, it seems that all, when you plan for the open often, actually you did the acquisition early this uh, the January, actually it's a hit there what's going on, right? So did you, how did you, um, so I just wanted to understand there, did you forecast that something happen or you just uh, thinking that is a very critical like a service for the industry? So how, how did you make the, such a strategic decision? To be honest, Echo, we got lucky. <laughs> um, uh, HVivo has been struggling. It, it raised £113 million in the last five years. It was losing lots of money because it tried to develop the world's first. We've also, within the company, we also have a 48% stake in the world's only phase three ready universal flu vaccine and also a phase one mosquito vaccine. Uh, that's within our company. Uh, so we acquired it all, but we're focused on the services. We liked the portfolio. We liked what we saw. Uh, three months ago, nobody wanted to know about a company that was world leader in the testing of vaccines. Uh, we bought it. We got it really cheap. We got it for 13 million. It came with 2 million cash and it came with 30 years of history and some of the largest vaccine companies in the world are all of being customers. And then, hey, presto, three months later, the world leader in the testing of vaccines and antivirals is suddenly a really interesting space. So let's be honest, we acquired a company and we got lucky. Right place, right time. <laughs> yeah, you get so much attention, but I'm sure you'll get a huge, like a feel responsibility as well, right? So many, you kind of like, you are the one probably can help us to really get out of the house earlier than later. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah. Uh, next, you were, but actually going more detail, share uh, the technology and the service you provide in this area. And so you can present your presentation now. Okay, let me try and bring it up. This will take a minute. And then we will uh, save 10 minutes for the Q&A. Do the share screen? Yeah, I'm doing share screen. It for some reason it's not. It worked before. In yes, the now. middle of the app. Yeah. What's that? It works now. Uh, the icon is in middle. Yeah, it's okay now. But not your presentation. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> um, maybe you close this one and then reshare again. Let's see. Uh, yes. Okay, can you see the presentation now? That's no, it's the template. You probably close this one, the template, okay. and uh, just I just stop your share. I cannot actually. Yeah, oh. strange. Uh -huh. It doesn't want, unfortunately, Echo doesn't want to let my presentation come up for some reason because <laughs> i've got the presentation the split screen is here in front of me oh, let's just uh, you uh share again put uh, your presentation in the front of you just like the first i think because you can uh share several different screens you may just close this one Okay. 
No, it doesn't want to go for some reason. You want me to come back out and come back in again and see if they do it that way? Yeah, sure. Okay, let me try. Or you can share the uh, PPT through the app. You can you can sh either share the screen or you can share the PPT. Uh, or you can send a. That's no, I think I think uh, oh, uh, oh, he can share the PPT through the app or uh, through the uh, Zoom. Because we can share the screen or we can share the file, the document. See, there is a enough. document on my screen now, but it's <gasps> it's good now. Can you see it there now? No. Yes, it's good. It's good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me bring. Yeah. You. Okay. Yeah. No, it doesn't allow me to. Okay. Look, what I'll do here is probably the most. Is that is that screen clear? Yes, um, very clear. Okay. It's look. What I'll do, I'm only going to zone in really on a couple of pages. This presentation is on the Open Orphan website under Open Orphan Investors presentation. So look, this really gives you a summary of what Open Orphan is. We say we're a unique European niche CRO, which is the world leader in running trials to test vaccines and antivirals. Uh, Open Orphan at the center, look, is an acquisition vehicle. And we acquired up on the, left, uh, on the top right-hand side during last year, Van Life Science office in Paris and Breda in the Netherlands, Holland. They're basically an early stage uh, preclinical uh, drug consulting company to help companies develop their drugs before they go into humans. The next product we have, we have a genomic health data platform. That was the basis of where we're collecting genomic data on all sorts of disease. Uh, and that's come together rather well. And we're updating that with the uh, H. Vivo have a lot of genetic data that's going in there. But the jewel in the crown is top left hand side, and we have H. Vivo London. Uh, we acquired them, say, being honest, we got lucky. We acquired them very cheap in January when the world didn't want to know about them. Uh, say it has a, the world's only 24 bed dedicated quarantine clinic in London. It's part of Queen Mary's Hospital. And we've also had $10 million spent on an on site uh, virology laboratory where we can genetically modify test do everything with 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 vaccine with uh, viruses with h vivo came 48 percent in immutex it almost came for free uh, and again in january the world had no interest in a universal flu vaccine uh, there was a lot of money spent developing that but it has a phase three ready universal flu vaccine and immutex also has a phase one completed universal mosquito saliva vaccine and the lancet uk is publishing results from the phase one from the mosquito vaccine trial, which I got are, are going to be pretty exciting in the coming weeks. So basically open orphan, we've, and lastly, we've got a repurposed Influen immune modulator, which again is really useful in the current environment. We've been worried about influenza and basically how you react to it. So that's kind of what we have. We have a, a number of companies, basically most of them revolving around our London headquarters subsidiary H Vivo. How does it fit together? I'll move the slide to. That's just a little history of the company. We have a very small market cap, 35 million. We had 4 million cash in the bank uh, at the beginning uh, of April, at the beginning of this month. We have net debt on 1.4. Uh, we're listed in London. We're also listed in the Dublin Stock Exchange, which gives us a, a, a co-listing on the Paris and Amsterdam Euronex. So we've got a Euro and we have a sterling listing. Uh, the largest single shareholder is myself and my colleagues with 20%. We've Invesco at 9.6, the former Woodford Holdings 7.3, and a range of other small uh, institutions in London uh, and family offices control the balance. Our main offices are London, Paris, and the Netherlands. Not to dwell too much in this, we look, there's a very small management team, the four of us run it. Uh, all of us have background that basically one could say almost entrepreneurs. Um, Complementary services, H Vivo fits like a glove with Van Life Science, and really it's focused on the customers. Both companies have been around for 30 years. We acquired both, we're less than a year old, but it would take us a lifetime to acquire the customers on the bottom right hand side here. We have everybody from, believe it or not, DARPA, that's the American Defense Research Organization, as a long term customer of H Vivo, across to people like Vertex, Galapagos, 
Ibsen, Janssen, Boiningler, Servier, basically Gilead, Merck, uh, all of these companies have been their world leading pharmaceutical companies and they've been using either HVIVO or the Venn offices in Paris or in for the last 25, 30 years. So it's pretty exciting to have them. Um, probably tell you what is a coronavirus challenge study model. That's what people's next question might be because let me talk you through that briefly because that is our basic, our gold dust. Um, this is what we have in London. We have a 24 bed quarantine clinic. You can see it on our website, either the Open Orphan website or the hvivo.com website. Uh, it's almost like a private hospital. Uh, it's the only one unique one in the world where everything is controlled inside the clinic, every room individually. It's a million dollars per room it costs to build. Again, we didn't spend that. That's why there was 113 million spent in this company and we acquired it for a 90% discount because it had lost its way. We acquired it for 13. On the right hand side, it's a unique virology laboratory. Again, over 10 million spent developing that on-site laboratory where we can develop and manipulate the viruses for our trials on-site. So everything is done in-house. What is a human challenge study model? That's where six months ago, I didn't know what they were. Simply, it's a way of testing vaccines really, really quickly. How you test any new drug, particularly a vaccine, you start first, you do an animal model, basically you test it in animals. Then you test it in humans phase one for toxicity to make sure it's not poisonous. Once you've passed phase one, you normally do these long, slow phase two, phase three trials. We do, uh, we shorten that and we basically, we test it in volunteers in our clinic where we vaccinate them uh, a month beforehand at home. Uh, we bring them in and for 10 days, they're carefully monitored in our high intensity quarantine clinic staff by nurses and doctors. We, after they've been inoculated with the vaccine, we then infect them. We actually make our patients sick, which is quite unique in the world. But we watch them carefully and we bring them through the sickness progression over the five, six days and they get well. The sickness we induce is generally nothing more than a sniffly nose, a sore head, and a mild version of the common flu, depends on which virus we're testing. This is so important in the day of coronavirus because we can, from start to finish, in a three month period, prove does a new vaccine work or not. So it's quite unique. It's very topical. Harvard issued a paper in the States two weeks ago saying the only way you can get a COVID-19 vaccine to the market late this year or next year is using a human challenge study model. We've worked with many companies you'll see on our website, many, many large international vaccine companies have used our facilities to test things like a flu vaccine, an RSV vaccine, a COPD vaccine. So we have a long history of testing vaccines. I've covered that the extensive portfolio. I think I've covered Immutex basically within our company. We're primarily a services company, but we do have some product. I say we own 48% of Immutex, which is basically a product company and it has two vaccines, a universal flu vaccine that's ready to go into phase three. We're not going to fund that phase three. We're looking to outlaze it to a pharmaceutical company. Any Western company or any Asian Chinese company is, is free to talk to us about getting the rights for a phase three trial to that. We also have a mosquito vaccine, which is past phase one, and the UK Lancet magazine is about to publish very interesting results in it. We also have the data platform and an immune uh, modulator for influenza. So it's an interesting number of products, but I say most of our investment and our share of the money is looking after the services. These are almost uh, low cost products we acquired and we're gonna outlast them. Data, uh, data platform is really interesting. Uh, we basically have a platform where people can uh, share the genetic data with us. We make it available to third parties and we then share whatever revenues we come with with those patients. It's quite unique. We've got a huge reservoir of data within HVIVO, going back over 30 years of genomic data. So post the HVIVO acquisition, we can now upload that data. Uh, we have permissions from the original owners of it and now share it with pharmaceutical companies so they can look for genetic mutations. Putting the two companies together, HVIVO and uh, Van Open Orphan, HVIVO have larger contracts three to five million for the last two to three years. 
the open orphan business model was half a million to seven million, one to eight years. Putting together our typical contract now is 10 to 20 million pounds in the last three to eight years. So the two companies fit rather well together. Um, open Orphan originally acquired Venn, uh, and again, it's very much Paris and Holland focus. And again, you'll see most of their customers are Northern Europe out of Germany, Holland or Paris, like say Ibsen, Boring Engler, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in Germany, farming a large Dutch company, Galapagos, some great household names there. HVivo, I'd say, I think it's said enough of them, other than again, look at the customer base we have there. Uh, good old DARPA, that's American Defense Organization, Vertex, Gilead, Merck, uh, Johnson, which is part of Johnson & Johnson, GSK, NIH, which is the National Institute of Health in North America. You would know a lot of governments around the world use our human challenge study model as a way of testing vaccines. And the position, we're very simply with a market leader in testing vaccines around the world using human challenge study models. It's nice, we're tiny, we're a very small little company, uh, but we acquired it, I think it was a very lucky acquisition. That's just, again, this deck is on our website. It's showing the overlapping uh, where there are open orphan and in, in blue and green, the HVivo uh, services fit together like a glove. We have a large pipeline of 82 million of potential contracts for this year. Uh, and we're pretty confident we're going to get a, a good chunk of those. And in the coming weeks, we hope to announce some more. Once contracts get signed, we announce them. Just today, we announced the testing uh, of an antiviral contract uh, in the London market. That's just talking about their immediate long-term synergies between these two companies together. We did put them together on the basis we were going to seek an exit by Christmas 2020. Uh, we said we weren't going to be in this business for long term. We wanted to put the two companies together, fix them and sell them. And that would be the plan. We're looking for an exit later this year. And we think if we sign a couple of world's largest vaccine production companies to help them develop COVID-19, finding a, a sale and exit for a company shouldn't be too hard. But again, that's not uh, an urgency. Our main urgency is make sure the companies get together and we launch some uh, COVID-19 challenge study models. And then revenue growth and profitability going forward, we acquired two loss making companies and we've turned them around and made them profitable. And that's the plans going forward as we speak. So that is hopefully a whistle stop tour of our presentation. Always open for questions and answers if he has them. Uh, and back to you, Echo. Um, thank you so much for sharing the uh, more detailed information. And so um, we saw that like, uh, uh, your, uh, I get it, the first question is about the, your revenue, and uh, we saw you already have the 80, you expect to have 80, uh, around the 80 million US dollar, uh, euro um, yuan uh, this year. So what what do you think, uh, like, uh, because of the vaccine, actually so many companies are focusing, develop the vaccine now, and uh, so what's your like a go-to client uh, strategy, especially global, China and the US? Yeah, look, I think our, our customer sheet you have seen in there, our go-to client are the world leading vaccine companies. That's our main market. But in this pandemic, we're also reaching out to governments around the world because we said we don't believe there'll be one vaccine that'll take all. There's going to be numerous vaccines that will work and will, each one will work different bits better than another. And there'll be numerous antivirals. So we're also, we said to you, we've, we've reached out to the Chinese government and say, look, um, to get any of our vaccines approved in China to prove they work. We're very happy to make our services available remotely from London and run China's first human challenge study model from London in China, which means within a three months period, you will know if your vaccines work. Naturally, then we want to do the same study in London because for regulatory approval to sell around the world, you'll need more multi-centers. But that was uh, an offer. Likewise, we've done that to North America, to relevant American organizations say, look, we will run human challenge study models. So yeah, so this is where we are. This is a worldwide um, effort uh, and we're happy to play our part in that. Yeah, so um, what's the challenge you are facing now trying to make the global cooperation? You just mentioned it, right? I think that that is amazing because uh, everyone is talking about the 
15 to 18 months to get a vaccine. And we even have the news so or the, uh, expect us to stay home probably the rest of the year. But three months, it seems like uh, it's really like a first time. I think that's every, every country or every the vaccine developer company need it uh, so we can reopen our business as well. So what's, but I definitely have your challenge there, right? What's the challenge? Yeah, well, first of all, I think the countries around the world won't be waiting for a vaccine to open up in the coming weeks and months. As soon as there's antivirals which are coming available, uh, as soon as the hospitals are proven they can deal with this peak, uh, I think you'll see countries around the world. Yes, we're going to have somewhat social distance, the new norm, but I see economies all around the world getting back to business in the coming weeks and months. So I don't think we're all going to wait for vaccines before people are going back to work. But uh, there will be a need for vaccines, and we all know vaccines take time. The biggest delay in a vaccine is testing it through phase three. Uh, I think we're in, one could say, a wartime, and in wartime, uh, governments make decisions to take shortcuts. So I think where belief at the moment is, if you want to get a vaccine to the market late this year, early next year, there's simply only one way to do it, and that's through a human challenge study model, where you test it in a controlled environment to prove efficacy. Okay. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, and uh, then um, there's audience askers say, what's your vision or what's your like a goal of the open often? Uh, I, I kind of hinted it earlier and I probably shouldn't be saying it. When we put the company together, we made it clear this was a consolidation, put one or two or three small loss making companies together and prepare it to be handed over to a, a larger, more effective organization. So the goal would absolutely be, as you said, I've, uh, uh, I've done a lot of things uh, in a career. I generally don't spend too long in any of them. So the long-term goal would be, let's consolidate it, put the company together, and find a larger CRO who would want this company, who can really deliver on everything for us. We, we, we genuinely believe we should be part of a bigger CRO, whether that's a Chinese CRO, a North American CRO, or a European CRO, we really don't mind. We're making it clear of a large clinical trial company, CRO, wants to have us, they, they can have us. Mm -hmm. So in the past few years, actually, is like a, yes, you built the, the other well-rounded full service for the, this special, the um, flu and the vaccine, and the, then now you think it probably is a good time to be working with the, to be part of the biggest CIOs. Absolutely. Look, we're a tiny little niche. Nobody wanted to know who HIV were three and six months ago. We acquired it. We've turned it around. We stemmed the losses. But we genuinely think it needs to be part of a larger service offering of a larger CRO. Uh, we're a niche. We say we're a niche CRO. We're unique. We're world, world leaders in testing vaccines and antivirals. Three months ago, that was a very small market. There wasn't much money spent developing vaccines and antivirals. But I think we all know in the days, months, and years ahead, governments and companies around the world will spend a lot more time and money developing not just COVID-19. There's going to be a big push to find uh, our other product, the universal flu vaccine, and numerous other vaccines. So it's going to be a growth space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see also the question they say, the, the, the news report that uh, probably the more such as a yes, pandemic will happen, uh, I hope not, but uh, it's kind of like we need to be prepared for that. To do what do you see like a strategy strategy for you? Uh, open often can um, contribute to uh, prevent another pandemic happen. And with good example, like oh, we've got a universal flu vaccine that works, and you no, know, we've only done phase one and two, two B. There's research published on our website that it looks like it works again any known form of influenza. The world worries the next pandemic could be an influenza pandemic, which could be much more toxic than COVID-19. Then a product such as ours, a universal flu vaccine, solves that problem. There's mm -hmm. lots of other companies in the world looking at developing a universal flu vaccine. It just turns out ours is probably one of the more advanced ones. Likewise, uh, as companies and governments want to develop uh, vaccines for other things, we can speed up that development. Okay. Yeah, I think actually uh, you have a lot of advantages. I, I also 
I also know that you have uh, been in China about, about uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, and also, uh, your company has about 30 years history. But have you already talked to some of the Chinese companies? If you want to talk to some of Chinese companies, what kind of the uh, cooperation you would like to uh, have in China? Yeah, no, China would be a country I've been very familiar with. That's why I, I, we would love being in London and Dublin. I think it's a crosswords between Europe, China, and the rest of the world. So, uh, yeah, the cooperation, we are talking to Chinese companies. Uh, we would be interested in getting investment. Uh, we're a public company. We're always open for investors. We'd love to see some Chinese companies invest in this. And we're offering our services, we think, given the pandemic is there. We're happy to share our knowledge, how to run a challenge study, and I think step one with Chinese companies, what we should do, given that travel is difficult for the next couple of months, uh, we would love to help any Chinese company, but particularly the Chinese regulator. We will run China's first human challenge study model remotely from London. Uh, and we're making that offer uh, to any Chinese company and the government say, look, we would love to help them and share that knowledge. Yeah, yeah. But I guess maybe the uh, vaccine companies uh, will uh maybe you will have more interest actually you know in china there's um, many listed vaccine uh, pharmaceutical companies and they have a big capital market like uh, the uh, shenzhen has a uh, shenzhen contact and uh, yunnan uh Volvax, Watson, and also many of the other pharmaceutical companies they do in the uh, vaccines they have a higher they have a high premium in their uh, on market and uh, I, I guess they will have more need if you uh, can cooperate with them, and uh, I guess that uh, you will have, uh, you also will have, uh, um, it will, it will be better than, than you to cooperate with other uh, traditional pharmaceutical companies like uh, the chemicals. I think for the uh, uh, the uh, biotech or the vaccine companies in China, you will have the more potential to cooperate. In a, and I guess uh, maybe you can do uh, some uh, studies or you can uh, get uh, to know some of them. Totally agree, Sean. Look, we're in a lucky position uh, that we, we, it's a small space, but it's getting bigger very rapidly. I think nobody around the table or nobody in the webinar thought uh, three months ago that the whole world would be locked down. It happened very fast, but I'm an optimist. I think it'll happen. It'll open up much quicker than many expect. I think life will get back to normal, uh, but it won't be the normal we knew. Social distance will remain there until it is a number and a range of effective vaccines and until COVID-19 is snuffed out. But I think going forward, there'll be a fear, well, what's the next one? Bear in mind, this is the first proper pandemic since the Spanish flu over 100 years ago. So it's a one in 100 years. I think the damage to world economies, you're going to have companies and governments spend a lot of money saying, right, we need a lot more universal vaccines that are, uh, for a range of potential diseases. Yeah, I have another question is, uh is uh, most of the uh, pharmaceutical companies they will do the R&D on human, on human clinical trials. But you know, they are, uh, in, in terms of the uh, vaccines, there are some animal vaccines. So do you have any experience on some animal vaccines? No, we're purely human. Uh, that's veterinary. It's a completely different area. We, we don't go near any veterinary products. Maybe from the data discovery? Oh yeah, <laughs> we, do animal, we do animal models, like basically, all and particularly our, our European business would specialize in animal models. That's we're testing a human therapy in animals as part of the before you go into the clinic before you test humans. But but testing animals, like say uh, drugs for animals, that's a very specialist space. It wouldn't be an area we would be involved in. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um. So there's. Uh, audience ask her, he's very curious about how the effects, uh, efficacy analysis of the vaccine and the drug treatment. And so could you elaborate a little more on what data do you monitor of the patients broadly speaking? Sorry, I could just, could the line broke up. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so uh, they try to understand uh, what kind of data do you monitor of the patient? Oh, absolutely. Well, a human challenge study model, you monitor everything. Uh, their temperature, their viral load, their viral shedding, everything. Basically, it's a formal clinical trial. Everything that brings us to an endpoint. Trials are set up to reach uh, endpoints. So we, we monitor virtually everything. We have them in. The beauty about a human challenge study model, the person comes in, it's in our clinic, a single dedicated room. 
that person doesn't leave that room for 10 days. It's a sealed room. Uh, you'll see the picture on our website. The nurses come in, they're fully gowned up and uh, they've actually got a respirator on so they're not even breathing the air in the room. That room is totally self-contained. There's a shower, there's a toilet, there's TV, there's unlimited games, unlimited video, unlimited Amazon, Netflix in the room. So we, we monitor virtually everything, including their tissues they use uh, are all bagged and subversely the person we've got monster amounts of data on each one of those patients that pass through so it means in that 10 day period we know more about a single patient and the disease engagement than maybe you would find out from a thousand person trial mm -hmm. okay and uh, another question is uh, um, so is that possible that uh, can start the human challenging trial in US or in China instead of remotely? Yeah, um, first of all, there's never been one run in China or Asia before, so that's what we're proposing at the moment, uh, that we could run one remotely. We'll help teach, educate, share our knowledge to do it. Uh, they take a lot of knowledge to get them going, uh, so we think China would be, should actively look at having its own human challenge study capability. We're very help, very happy to help them build it. Like we're only a services company, so we don't have to worry about sharing IP. We're happy to share our services. That's the benefit of not being intellectually focused. We're, we're more services focused. Uh, North America, the American government has, for in recent years, tried to encourage universities to do human challenge studies. Uh, one of the limiting factors is for every single patient you recruit, and you need to have about 100 patients to get statistical relevance, because half of them will get a placebo, half of them will get the real vaccine. But we need to basically, on average, uh, screen 20 to one. So to get 100 patients, uh, we need to screen quite a few thousand patients. And being located in London, we have a website called FluCamp, www.flucamp.com. And that's where we recruit our patients. Uh, we got 54,000 unique signups in the last six weeks, people offering help with the coronavirus. But recruiting volunteers, no matter where in the world, is one of the trickier parts because you've got to screen uh, that 3,000 patients to get to a 100-person trial. You could screen them for bloods, uh, drugs, tobacco, smoking, everything. So yeah, there's a bit of a skill to that. But we believe in a couple of years, there will be human challenge study centers in China, uh, somewhere like Peking University uh, and North America. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably room in Europe for probably the HV will conserve as most of the European market from London. Uh, again, you don't need many of them, but I think there should definitely be a, a human challenge uh, model uh, center based in China. Okay. So you just a little bit of a learning curve, right? About the, the uh, hire the volunteers. So, so um, there's a next question is uh, the, uh, someone very interested in your full phase three asset. You just mentioned that you're ready for license out. Can you uh, talk uh, more about it, these assets? Yeah, again, lots of details on our website about it. It's a, it's a T cell based uh, peptide, uh, influenza peptide based platform, it's novel. Uh, it's had some fantastic phase two data, which was published on our website in the last three months. It has come through all trials. We're getting it ready for a phase three FDA uh, process, but we're not going to, that will, that will be a 50 to 100 million process. That will be, we're looking to, to out license that product to Big Pharma. Mm. Uh, we don't mind as a Big Pharma in China or Big Pharma anywhere else in the world, but it's an asset. It's available for out licensing. And really importantly, within that company, it's called Immutex. Uh, we own 40% of it. We also have the piece I'm really excited about because I travel a lot around the world, uh, is that we also have a phase one completed universal mosquito saliva vaccines. That means uh, that any disease carried by the mosquito, you technically get universal immunity to it. And that covers dengue fever, malaria, and Zika. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is a huge problem too in the past few years, Zika. And that's very good. And uh, so I will take uh, the last question. Um, they actually, especially for China, they say the, uh, I think uh, uh, Sean already <laughs> talked a lot about uh, China, but uh, they wanted to ask you just like uh, you're looking for the um, investor or the 
um, maybe potential uh, M and A, and they wonder what's your timeline, and just uh, because you are already a public company, so uh, their management team will stay. So um, they are very curious about your planning. Yeah, good question. Look, as a public company, we're always welcome new investors. So we're always open for business. Anybody wants to buy shares, invest in a company, uh, we're open for business. You can check our symbol as on the Bloomberg screen, it's O R P H on the Bloomberg screens. We're listed in London, and we say we're listed in the European uh, Euronext exchanges as well. Uh, we we have guided the market that what we're doing, we're fixing up a number of struggling companies. We're very happy continuing running the company for the next couple of years. But likewise, we do believe um, the world leader in testing vaccines, this company could be in the hands of a, a larger CRO. Uh, we believe actually maybe some Hong Kong listed Chinese CRO, this would be a, a very interesting, tasty morsel to have. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. That's great information to share. So I think uh, uh, because of the time, uh, constraint so we will end our webinar by now but we definitely will take the conversation offline so uh, for the audience if you have any more questions you can send it to our uh, group which are group or you can reach out to us and we will connect to or with uh, you directly thank you so much for joining us today echo sean thank you very much for your time thank, thank you. you thank you so, Again, thanks everyone joining our webinar. And uh, so stay safe and healthy. And also I want to just a special thanks to everyone working in the uh, front line and uh, who are developing their vaccine or treatment uh, for uh, this uh, COVID-19 and also other healthcare providers who are working in the front line. That's really keep us safe. And hope uh, uh, we will go through this soon and uh, we can meet uh, each other in person soon. Thank you so much.